Good evening, Mount Zion Baptist Church. It is a joy to come to you tonight and invite you to worship alongside Brother Edwin and myself. And I want to call you to worship by reading one of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture. Just as soon as I say that, next week I'm going to say another verse is the most powerful verse I know of. All Scripture is inspired and all of it's wonderful, but I particularly love this verse. And if you will remember, our very first, I believe, virtual worship service, I read this Scripture. And we were doing our best to pull together our first virtual worship service. And this is the scripture that I read to you. It's from Matthew 16, 18. Jesus says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Who is responsible for building the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? It is God himself. And it is Jesus who wants to build his church. We're going to do our very best and we're going to try our best to be faithful. We're going to persevere amidst any obstacle. We're going to collaborate well. We're going to strategize. We're going to think. We're going to utilize whatever experience and education and tools that God has given us. But ultimately, it is Jesus who builds his church. And he has promised to do that. And so I, as the under-shepherd of Mount Zion Baptist Church, I am trusting God to do what only God can do. And let me just say, God is doing it. And we're so thankful for the people that God is bringing to our church. It, it's a thrill that we would even need to have a membership information class in, in the middle of an international pandemic. God is good. And some of these people are getting faithfully involved in serving. And we're so excited about that. But just take a moment today and just relish in the fact that Jesus has promised to build his church. So if you are a part of Mount Zion Baptist Church, if you are meaningfully involved in the ministry here, you are a part of something that is so much bigger than you, so much bigger than us. You're a part of God's plan, God's epic plan to build up his church, and he's going to do it on the firm foundation of his word and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sunday, September the 20th, we are celebrating 165 years of gospel ministry. What do we say? Well, we say what Matthew 16, 18 says. Jesus says, I will build my church. And Jesus has faithfully done that for 165 years. Our theme is cornerstone forever faithful. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of Mount Zion Baptist Church. It's certainly not myself. It's not our staff. It's not... It's not our program structure, it's not our facilities, but Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And so today, we give thanks to God for being the firm foundation upon which he has built this church for over 165 years. So Jesus is our cornerstone, and Jesus is also forever faithful. He's been faithful for 165 years. Today, in the middle of an international pandemic, Jesus is faithful. And because he has been faithful, because he is faithful today, we can project that Jesus will be forever faithful. And we can sing that great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and mean it from our heart because Jesus is so faithful. What a great reminder for you tonight. I don't know where you are in your life, in your spiritual journey, but you're apparently watching this video because you are wanting to know what God might say to you from the book of Malachi. I just want to say to you tonight, regardless of who you are, Jesus is is the foundation for your life, and he will be forever faithful. And whatever way that you're doubting that he may not come through for you or you don't know what's about to happen, I just want you to know that Jesus will be forever faithful in your marriage, in your parenting, in your personal health, with your present, with your future. Jesus is forever faithful. Well, we have several things that we want to pray for tonight. I want to lift up our teachers who are getting back to school. People are coming back on campus. Children are coming back on campus. And that has been staged out in different ways throughout the private school system and now the public school system. Be in prayer for our teachers. We love our teachers. And we love all of our students. We love students in the community, especially all the young people that uh, are involved in our ministry here at Mount Zion Baptist Church. And so we pray. We pray for them. We pray that God would keep them healthy. We have a keen interest in what's going on in the state of California. 
This year, over 2.2 million acres have been devastated by wildfires. Over 3,000 structures have been destroyed, burned to the ground. People have lost their lives. Currently, even today, there's 14,000 plus firefighters battling these fires in, in Northern California and, frankly, throughout the state. So there is something uh, of grand, on a grand scale, taking place in California. So we need to be in prayer for them. Let's join together in prayer, and then we're so excited to hear what the Lord has laid on uh, Dr. Edwin Jenkins to share with us. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we're so excited that you are going to build your church, because whereas we can't do it, we know that you can and you will, and you promise to do that. So thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of our church. It's not our program, it's not our budget, it's not our ideas, it's not our philosophy of ministry. It is you. It's a person, and it's you. You are the foundation of our church. And so we thank you for building it. As we try our best as a staff to be faithful in teaching and sharing the gospel and making disciples. And Lord Jesus, you have been forever faithful. And we know that you will be forever faithful. Great is your faithfulness. Every point of our lives, we could say, God, that you have been faithful. So, Lord, for every challenge that we've not yet faced here at our church, we are counting on your unfailing faithfulness. And we walk by faith and not by sight through each and every mountain and valley. Lord, thank you that you will be faithful for another 165 years or however long it takes until, Lord Jesus, you come back for us. God, we lift up our teachers who are still doing some virtual training, but also now are uh, inviting students back into their classrooms. Father, we pray for their safety, for their well-being. We pray that you would uh, quicken their steps and their minds to mold all these young hearts and people. Father, we pray that uh, the students would be kept well also. We pray that you would help both the students and the teachers through a very difficult transition time. May your blessings especially be upon uh, all of those who are involved in our ministry, who are also involved in the community, in school, teaching or learning. Father, we pray for those who have been greatly impacted by all of these fires, wildfires in California. With so much devastation before so many people, we pray, Father, that your mercy and your compassion would be made real. We pray that the church would be the church. We ask God that you would extend your compassion to all those who have suffered. And now, Father, for our time, for our study of your word, we thank you for what you're going to show us. Quicken our minds to learn everything that you want us to learn. Help us not to miss out on a single morsel that we need to be nourished with. And may your Holy Spirit descend upon your servant, Brother Edwin Jenkins, in a palpable way, in a powerful way, in a way that's evident not only to him, to him as he teaches, but to us as we listen. Open our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. I am so excited to be a part of this time with you. Each one of you have set aside time to be a part of this, and I am so grateful that you have. I am so grateful to be here and be a part of it, and I am just a part of it. Most important actor in all of this is our Lord Jesus Christ, his presence here in this place. As, uh, as Pastor was praying there, I was thinking, I am so glad that we don't have to have prayer tokens, aren't you? Uh, I would run out of tokens. And, and, and I would be afraid that I would use up my tokens. Aren't you glad that we don't have to run out of prayer tokens? I am grateful that, that it's unlimited. We have unlimited access to the throne room of God. And I am so grateful to begin and close our meetings with prayer and to have prayer in our meetings. It is so, so very important that we seek the mind and the heart and the presence of God. We're involved in Bible study, and as you can see here, rekindle the fires of faith. There's such a need for that, a continual need for that in our lives, continual need for that in my personal life. And we're looking at Malachi's message because Malachi gets really to the heart of what it is in that rekindling effort that we need. 
Now, this is session number two, and uh, we began with session number one last week. Today, we're with session number two, and we'll follow on through with nine sessions. And I want to encourage you to invite people to come with you, invite people to be a part of this time with you, or indicate to them that they also can tune in and be a part of this time. Because while each and every session will stand on its own, uh, they do connect because we're looking at the book of Malachi. Well, do you have your copy of the Word, however you're going to use it? I hope that you do. I have mine. I'm using the New International Version. And you can use whatever version you like, but uh, just to let you know so that when I read, if the reading's a little bit different, it's because I'm reading from the New International Version. And also, I wanted you to be sure uh, that you have uh, uh, some note paper. Uh, normally, I would be giving out to you in a Bible study notes, uh, note paper, and uh, things that you could fill in, and, and perhaps even fill in the blank or paragraph uh, breaks where you could fill in other notes, but you'll need to do that on your own. And I really would like like to encourage you uh, to do exactly that. I think it's very important for us to take notes. Now, I'm a, I'm a visual learner. I'm an auditory learner, but I'm also a visual learner and an experiential learner. And so I want to encourage you to, to take notes if, uh, if you are able to do that. And I encourage you to take notes, write things down, be able to look at those things later on and refer back to those things. We're looking at the book of Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. Uh, we introduced this last time, so I'll not uh, recap that. I think that you can go back on the studies and check session one if you would like to. But tonight we're going to get right into session number two. Now, session number two is a look at worthy worship, and this is part one. We're going to have part one, then we're also going to have part two. In fact, I would love to have eight or ten sessions on worship, just to talk about worship. I think that, as, as has been said, is the missing jewel of the church. Uh, you say, well, no, we always have worship. Yes, we do. But there's so much more. And I hope to reveal some of that to you. And most importantly, I hope the Holy Spirit reveals some of that to you during our time together in looking at the Word of God together. Uh, Karl Barton, even though we might not agree with all of his theology, Karl Barton said this, and it's a, it is a profound statement. Christian worship is the most momentous, the most urgent, the most glorious action that can take place in human life. Mm -hmm. I agree wholeheartedly with that statement. It is the most important thing that we do. And uh, when I look at this passage, I, I look at the passage and uh, here in Malachi chapter 1, if we skip down to verse 10, now we're going to come back to verses 6 through 14, or tonight we're going to look at uh, verses 6 through 12 in particular, but skip down to verse 10 for just a moment. We're going to come back. Listen to what this says. Uh, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Now, what an amazing statement. Is God disagreeing with, with what we've just said? Is he disagreeing with the fact that Christian worship is the most momentous, the most urgent, the most glorious action that can happen in a human life? Oh, no. No, he is simply giving a corrective to the people, the people of Israel who are there in that day. God desires worship. But I want you to see here, he wants worthy worship. In fact, you're going to see that God literally refuses unworthy worship. He will not accept it as being worship. I think that, that we must give of our best to the master. Uh, I want us to, to pause again, and I want us to pray that God will illuminate our hearts in a special way, that he will give me just the economy of words that I need to share with you. 
and that the Holy Spirit will empower those words from the Word of God to your heart, to your life, and to my heart and to my life at the same time as well. I believe that God can do that, and that is an amazing thing in and of itself. So let's pray toward that end. Lord, Right now, I thank you for each of these who've joined us. I thank you for the beginning time in prayer that we've already had as our pastor led us. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with me now. I pray that I'll be out of the way, that Jesus Christ will be clearly seen, and that your truth will be heard not only in our ears and perceived not only in our minds, but I pray that we'll touch our hearts. I pray that my heart will be touched I pray that the heart and life of every person who has joined us will be touched, and I pray that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Now notice what it says in the passage. In verses 6 through 9, we're going to look at that first because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about God honoring himself through worship. Let's get right into it. Verse 6. A son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? Now that's what I was referring to a moment ago. God desires worship. But God desires worthy worship. We're to give of our very best to God. Unworthy worship is worship where we become self-centered, where we have become selfish, and where we are focused on ourselves and not on the God whom we have come to worship. We're to worship him. Later on, Jesus says that we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. And we're going to see that clearly in what we're talking about. Now, now notice that word that I just quoted to you. We're to worship in spirit and in truth. You see, our concept of God, as I shared with you last week, our concept of God has everything to do with our commitment to God. Your concept of God has to do with your commitment to God. You commit to the level of your concept of God when you're committing yourself to God. And your commitment to God has everything to do with your conduct before God. And that's what we're looking at. Now, what had happened here with the priests, obviously, and with the people following after the priest, is that they had become very selfish, they'd become very self-centered, and they were not honoring God with true God-honoring worship. And that's what we want to be very sure that we do not do. Notice this first point. What is worthy worship? What is it? What is worthy worship? If God refuses unworthy worship, if he says it would be better for you to close the temple doors because I'm not going to hear anything, I'm not going to, to uh, take the offering that you offer to me, what is worthy worship? If he's refusing unworthy worship, let's look at the first point. Worthy worship is worship in which we honor God. We honor honor the God who made us. We honor the God who loves us. We honor the one who is the source of life and who is the sustainer of life and who ultimately will conclude our lives. Our concept of God is so very, very important. Uh, a fact of the matter is this, that it is inadequate views of God Inadequate views of God, of God's love, of God's will, of God's desire, of God's work. Inadequate views of God lead to inadequate, immature, and uninformed attitudes and approaches in worship. If we're not adequately viewing God, if we're not revering God, 
if we're not magnifying God, if when we come to worship, we have not prepared to meet with God, then very likely our attitudes are wrong, our approaches is wrong, are wrong, and, and God will say, never mind. That's not worthy worship. Worthy worship honors God. Let's, let's read a little further in the text here. Verse 7, he says to them, they, he's, he's saying, You ask me, how have we shown contempt for your name? And he says in verse 7, By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals... Is that not wrong? And then he says this as an exclamation, I would think. Try offering them to your governor. Try offering to the governor. Try offering to the government. Try offering to the state the things that you're offering to me. And God goes on to say here, would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Now plead with God to be gracious with us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you? Malachi is saying, this is not right. And that's literally a statement that God is making. Notice what it says there. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you? Says the Lord God Almighty. So important that we offer to God our best. When I was a young person growing up, I had to go back and find this in an old hymn book, because it's not in our most recent hymn books, and certainly not in our most recent songs. And so I searched back through the old hymn book, and I found this song that I grew up singing that was taught to us as young people those eons ago when I was a young person. Listen to what it said. Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Throw your soul's fresh glowing ardor into the battle for truth. Jesus has set the example. Dauntless was he, young and brave. Give him your loyal devotion. Give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Clad in salvation's full armor, join in the battle for truth. That's a rally cry, isn't it? Give of your best. Give of your best. And that's what God calls on you to do. And that's what God calls on me to do. Let's look for a moment. Let's skip ahead just a moment here. We're to verse 9, and I realize that. But I want you to go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. Listen to what he says. If you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've already cursed them, because you've not resolved to honor me. What is God saying to you and me tonight? He's saying, Edwin, be sure that you're resolved to honor me when you come to worship. As I was thinking about this and meditating upon this, there were three words that as I meditated upon this became came to my mind. First words, preparation. Do you prepare when you come to worship? Do you get ready? Preparation. You say, oh, of course, I put my clothes on and come. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think it's a good idea for you to wear your clothes when you come to church, but, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something more. I'm talking about your mind. I'm talking about your heart. I'm talking about your will. Do you really get ready? Do you prepare yourself when you come to worship? Do you prepare your, your mind, your heart, your soul? Are you ready when you come to worship? Preparation. And then when you come to worship, participation. 
preparation leads to participation. So you're in worship and you're sitting there and you're ready and things are going on and, and, and there is involvement going on and the people on the platform are seeking to lead you and encourage you. And are you participating? Are you involved in that worship? You say, well, sometimes I sing the songs, but sometimes I don't sing the songs. Sometimes I, I, I get involved. Sometimes I don't get involved. Uh, when, when pastor's praying, when others are praying, when the Bible is being read, are you, are you searching that out? Is your mind somewhere else? Now, if we get our minds prepared to come to worship and then we participate in worship, then there's another word. And that's perception. What do you perceive in worship? Do you perceive the presence of a living God? You say, oh, Edwin, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a tall order. But that's why we're there. We're there. And he said where two or three are gathered in his name, there he will be in the midst of them. We're to perceive his presence when we come together to worship. That's why we read it here in verse 10 where God is saying, Oh, that you just shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. He says, he says, close the doors. There's no use in coming in because the fires are useless if your heart is not with me. You might want to jot those words down. Prepare. Participate and perceive. You prepare to come to worship. You participate in worship. You really get involved in worship. You, you begin to sit up in worship instead of lounging in worship. I used to uh, think about the pews that there were in, uh, in churches where I grew up, and particularly in my home church. They had those, it was a Georgian co colonial architecture of the church, which many of the churches were built in those days. And uh, they had caps on the pews. You could lean up on one of those pews. I have a friend, and, and I think he wouldn't mind me calling his name, Billy Chapel. He told me that one Sunday he had the best Sunday he had ever had. How so, Billy? He said, well, I got over on the edge of the pew, and I put my arm up on the pew. I put my arm up on the pew. I went to sleep. And I slept through, and Edwin, I woke up right at the time of the ending of the service. It was right on time. What a great day I had. You say, Edwin, that's awful. Yeah, I agree. Now, Billy was a young person, but sometimes we go to sleep in church, don't we? I used to have a problem with that. I used to have a problem of dozing off. I came to realize the problem was not with the singing. The problem was not with the scripture reading. The problem was not with the praying. The problem was not with the pastor's message. The problem was with I. It was with me. The problem was with me because I wasn't really participating. I wasn't really there. I, I read an interesting story of a man who'd seen one of those advertisements. Have you seen those advertisements where they say a uh, free checking account, open an account for only $5 and you can have a free checking account? He said, what a deal. I'm going to do that. I can open an account for $5. And so he did that. He went into the bank and he opened the account for only $5. He opened his account and he said, this is the best thing ever. And, and the next week he came into the bank. He walked into the bank and he said, now, I, I, I forgot to get my checks last week, but, but I've opened an account here and uh, it was back before you had to uh, have your name on the checks. And, and he said, could I have some of the counter checks? And they gave him a counter check. And so he wrote out a check. He put his name on it, put all the, the vital information on it that they needed to have. And then he went up to the teller and he handed her a check asking her for a hundred dollars. And she checked his name and she checked his account. He said, sir, uh, I can't give you $100. He said, oh, yes. I opened my account last week when it was $5 to open a free checking account. And I just would like to get $100 out today. She said, sir, sir, it doesn't work that way. You have to put something in in order to get something out. He said, oh. That's the way it works. If 
Folks, what do you put in when you come to worship? What do you invest of yourself? And you see, the people in that day, the people of Israel, they were going through the motions and they went through them very, very well. I mean, they really had it down. Isaiah talks about this. They had everything down pat. They were going through the motions, but now they had let it degenerate a little bit. They had let it degenerate a little bit to where the point, did you see that as we, we read through that just a moment ago about what, the, what, Jesus, what God says to them in verse 7, excuse me, verse 8, when, the, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to the governor. He says, uh, the governor won't receive those things, and, and, and I will not receive those things. What a thought. What a thought. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we read about worship and how important worship is. I'm going to just simply look with you to a few verses uh, in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus chapter 4 verse 31. Exodus chapter 4 verse 31. Notice what it says in chapter 4 verse 31. Here the children of Israel uh, are, are, are learning from God. Moses has returned to Egypt with his father-in-law and then and then if you pick up in verse 29 of Exodus 4, second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 4, verse 29, Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He performed the signs before the people, and they believed. Now listen. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery... He had seen their misery in their bondage. They bowed down and worshipped. They knew the Lord had heard. The Lord had seen. He knew their misery. He knows our misery. Do we respond by being prompted to bow down and worship and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for seeing where we are. Do we offer to him our very, very best? You see, the idea is that we reference God. We come to God. We reference God. We offer God our very best. Why? We want to glorify God. We want to honor God. We want to acknowledge God. An extended session worker was walking with one of the little boys in her church and uh, the worship service was going on and as she walked with that little boy I don't know if she'd taken him to the restroom or whatever that's not important but she was walking with him and he they happened to walk past the worship center and and he could hear them singing and uh, he said uh, ma'am are they doing business with God there he had a good point do you remember when Jesus was in the temple Jesus said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I shared something with churches in the past, and that is this, and I would share it with you now. The business meeting of the church is not what we call the business meeting of the church. That's the church conferring about God's will and trying to discern together God's will. That's what we call business meeting. But the business meeting of the church is when we meet together so that we can offer praise to an audience of one and we can adore him. That's doing business with God. That's doing business with God. And oh, how we need to do business with God. Jesus, as a boy, knew what that was about. So the primary audience for us when we come to church is God. The word there in, in Exodus is the word shaka. That's the word in the Hebrew. But then we go to the, the, the New Testament. In the New Testament, there's a, an amazing word that I have to mention to you, and that is proskuneo. It is a word that is composed of two words, towards and kiss. We kiss toward God. In worship, proskuneo, we kiss toward God. We say, God, we love you. God, we love you. 
You see, we're not there to evaluate how well the music is done. We're not there to evaluate how well the preacher does. We're there to kiss God. Another New Testament word for worship is letruo, and, and it is a word that basically means to serve or to render religious service, homage to God. We're there to serve God. We're there to offer unto God. We're not there to serve one another. Those who are leaders in worship are there to prompt us so that we together, so that we together, we who are worshipers and they who are on the platform can can orchestrate us offering something to that audience of one who is God. Henry Ward Beecher, great speaker, great preacher of years gone by, was one who drew many, many people to his church to preach, to hear him preach. Henry Ward Beecher was, was very much listened to. His brother was Thomas Beecher. On one occasion, Henry Ward Beecher was away, and uh, his brother Thomas K. Beecher was going to preach. And so Thomas K. Breacher was going to preach on that day, and, and uh, the people had come and filled the church as normally they did, and uh, Thomas K. Beecher got up to speak. The people were disappointed, and some of the people even got up and began to leave. At that point, Thomas Beecher stopped them, and he said, those of you who have come here today to worship Henry W. Beecher may go ahead and exit. Those of you who have come here today to worship Almighty God should be seated as we continue. Who, what do you come to church to do? We come to church to honor God. The Old Testament and the New Testament is filled with with instruction regarding that. Notice what it says in verse 10. Notice what it says in verse 10. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple. We've read that a couple of times already. So that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Now look at verse 12. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is deviled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. That takes us on into verse 13. But look at it and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. Whenever the people were coming to worship, they realized that what they were offering to God was not their best. It was secondary to their best or tertiary, or it was even worse. It was just down the line. It was not their best blind animals and, and things that, that they wouldn't even offer to the governor for taxes, and yet they were coming to bring that. Oh, folks, I want you to know, I want you to know that we have the privilege of worshiping Almighty God. Almighty God, and every time we come together, that's why we come together. And that's why in Hebrews we read, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As our pastor has led us through the book of Revelation in such a marvelous way. Folks, we've seen the day approaching, haven't we? We've seen what that day is going to be. We need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We need to assemble together as often as we possibly can and magnify the name of the Lord our God. We need to glorify His name. We need to shout hallelujah. We need to shout praise the Lord. We need to shout amen. So be it. Let it be. God, we love you. Oh, that's important. When I was pastoring in Birmingham at Hilldale Baptist Church, Charlie Martin was our minister of worship and music, and oh my, he was such a such a good friend to me, and he's continuing now in ministry. 
But Charlie and I had an epiphany at the same time. You say an epiphany? Yes, just a, almost like it was a dawning light to us. And that was this, that the most important thing that any church does is worship. You say, oh, no, 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 Edwin, you're, you're way off base there. The most important thing we do is, is witness. The most important thing we do is make disciples. I agree. We need to live sent to make disciples. And I have a discipleship group. In fact, I have another accountability group. And I am, I am I'm convinced that we are to make disciples. But, folks, that's not where you begin. You begin by praising God. You begin by getting caught up in loving God and magnifying God and glorifying His name. And that becomes the foundation. And then we go out to fulfill the Great Commission. And then when we win people to Christ, when we witness and we win them to Christ, you see, I wear my little bracelet that gives the four spiritual laws. I wear that everywhere I go so that I might have an opportunity to tell people about Jesus. We witness and then we disciple those who trust Christ. But the foundation of that is Almighty God. He's the foundation. Why is it that some of us have a hard time being convinced that we ought to make disciples? It's because we don't love God enough. You see, loving God comes first. Your concept of God has everything to do with your commitment to God. And your commitment to God results in your conduct before God. I believe that God wants us to live sent to make disciples every day we possibly can. And the foundation of that comes when I really fall in love with God. When I really love Him. When I really give Him my best. When I give of my best to the Master. When we look at this, that's that second thing there. Worthy worship is worship when we in which we are helped, you say, oh yeah, I'll get to that helping part. What what does worship do for me? Well, first of all, it's doing for God. But let me tell you what happens when you worship. And you may want to jot some of these things down. When you worship for your loneliness, and we all feel lonely at times, God gives us his presence. He gives his presence for our loneliness. Some of us have felt lonely during this time of the pandemic. Well, let me tell you, when we learn to worship God, when we learn to magnify God, even if we're doing it and we're, we're, we're having to do it over the airwaves, even when we're having to do it online, oh, dear friends, you can still praise and magnify and worship God. You can still praise and magnify Him. And for loneliness, He gives His presence. I read an interesting story about a little boy. He'd come in to see his dad. His dad was working at his desk. And as his dad worked at his desk, working with some papers and working with some things, as often he did, the little boy came and just stood. He stood right there in front of him. And as he was standing right in front of him, dad finally um, noticed that he was there, looked away from the work that he was doing, and he picked up a quarter that he had on his desk, and he said, Here, son, you can have this. And the little boy, small boy, said, I don't want any money, Daddy. And so the dad said, Okay, that's fine. So he began to work again. He began to jot things down. He began to do things there at his desk. And, and as he worked along, he, he noticed that the boy had not left. Hmm. He had a piece of candy on his desk. He said, here, son, I bet you'll like this. And he handed him a piece of candy. And the little boy took the piece of candy. And then he handed it back to him and said, Dad, I don't want candy. And so the dad said, okay, son. And he began to work again. He worked and worked and worked again. And he noticed the little boy was still standing there. He looked at him and said, son, you said you didn't want any money. And you said you didn't want any candy. What do you want? He said, Daddy, I just want to be with you. I just want to be here with you. That's what it is to worship in a worthy way. God, I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. And when I gather together with your people, I feel like I'm with you. 
I feel like I'm with you. And I'm not lonely anymore. And even if you can't be at church in the pandemic, folks, we join together even when it is online. What else does God give you? What else does he offer to you? Let me share this with you, that he offers to you for your weakness. He gives strength. He gives total power, total power. Let me read something to you. P.T. Forsyth said this, unless there is within us that which is above us, we will soon yield to that which is around us. Unless there is that in us, within us, which is above us, we will yield to that which is around us. Sometimes we yield to our circumstances because we don't have enough of that which is above us in us. And that's what we get when we come to worship. Let me go quickly. For anxiety, he brings peace. For anxiety, he brings peace. I can assure you that that's true. I can assure you that he is an anxiety reliever. And when we open ourselves and really focus on God, it's amazing how the troubles flee. And then for our inconsistency, he brings tremendous stability to our lives. Need an answer for your loneliness? Worship. Need an answer for your weakness? Worship. You need an answer for your anxiety? Worship. You need an answer for your inconsistency? Worship. But be sure that your worship is a worship of Almighty God, not anything else, because nothing else will do. I want to simply say to you, we offer ourselves to God and we receive God back to ourselves. And so, when worship truly happens, we find that our consciences are quickened by God's holiness. Our minds are nourished with God's truth. Our imaginations are purified by God's beauty. Our hearts are open to God's love and our wills are surrendered to God's purpose. Worship. Worship, worship. There's so much more in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that I want to share with you. And we'll save that until we get to part two, session number two, part two, next week. I want to bow with you again in prayer. If you will bow with me as we close out this study for this evening. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the time we've had together. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for what you teach us about worship. Help us to catch it, Lord. And I pray that our worship will be worthy and that you will receive it from our minds, our hearts, and our wills. In Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless you. See you next week.